conflicts of interest. And I am pleased to talk to you today about Vaping 2020. Uh, this is one of the very first times that I've been able to give a grand round on the day that major releases were given uh, by the CDC on this topic. So we'll talk about the um, MMWR release of the Youth Tobacco uh, Survey um, as we go through this, but I think you'll find that this will be very helpful to you in your practice. So our learning objectives are to look at the trends in electronic cigarettes and vaping among middle and high school students. We'll talk about the road to addiction, the impact of nicotine and flavorings, and the respiratory consequences of vaping, as well as Ivali. We will not be talking about um, electronic cigarettes as a potential uh, cessation device, as you might have heard of with the adults, um, but this is not something that has strong support. So let's look at our kids. Who will replace the old smokers? They have a very limited amount of time. R.J. Reynolds said all the way back in 1982, if I don't get you by 18, the odds are three to one. I never will. So what, how is the tobacco industry responding? They spend more than a million dollars every hour of every day to get our children involved in tobacco, whether it's cigarette smoking or vaping. So it's a very large commitment on their part, something that has not been matched by the public health um, organizations. So as you might expect, these are the usual suspects that uh, are involved in the vaping products. Some of these brands you'll recognize right away. The company that sells Cool sells Blue, Marlboro sells Mark 10, Camel sells Views. But the uh, vape product that has the largest market share, has about three quarters of the market share as of uh, 2019 is Juul. And while Juul is not technically owned by Big Tobacco, the Atria Group, which is the maker of Marlboro, invested $12.8 billion last year, giving it a 35% stake in that company. Now, what's interesting when I went back to look at this, the easiest way for me to find the information was through Investopedia. And it quotes one of the Juul founders speaking to its shareholders, saying that Juul uses a proprietary nicotine, which delivers a bigger punch as compared to similar products on the market, owing to the fact that it contains 10 times as much nicotine as other e-cigarettes. He said the idea behind the blend was to eliminate the need for smokers to go back to cigarettes after an unsatisfying experience with vaping. Now, our experience with Juul is relatively short. It was first introduced into the market in 2015. Now, for the pediatricians who've been in practice for a while, you may be able to pick out the one advertisement that comes from the Smithsonian. And you can see it right to the center, the guy with the skateboard or the surfboard. I'm not quite sure which one that is. But in any case, that's the one from the Smithsonian. And all around that, you can see all of the um, examples of ads for e-cigarettes. Notice that there are subtle words hidden in there that are sub a little bit subliminal, things like success, and you can look around and see that um, the people who vape are very popular, having very good times, they're invited to parties, they play music, and if you're not one of those party people, you can have your e-cigarettes delivered directly to your home. Now we know that teens spend an average of seven hours, almost seven and a half hours on their phones a day. So very frequently, one of the major ways that they're gonna communicate with your children are gonna be on social media. So even when the FDA required Juul to take down some of its ads targeting uh, children on Facebook, the kids were promoting this on their own. So here are some interesting quotes there, but they're pretty much similar. So we'll go through them quickly. Um, as you saw with the maker of Juul. But basically, these people are very, very good at looking at developmental pediatrics. 
They know what the uh, psychosocial issues are with teens. And so this was the first one um, was from Why One Smokes. And they said smoking is a, smoking a cigarette for the beginner is a symbolic act. I'm not my mother's child. I'm tough. I'm an adventurer. I'm not square. And that's exactly what you saw in all of those advertisements, all the way back from the Smithsonian to current day. The second one is also from some thoughts about new brands. This was um, R.J. Reynolds again. And he talks about the developing self, self image of the young person. It needs all the support and enhancement that it can get. And we know that smoking seems to um, enhance that image. It's been deliberately marketed that way, and you can see it in all of their ads. So kids are exposed to e-cigarette advertisements everywhere, TV, media, retail stores. And not only are they exposed to the advertisements, but they can go online and not only learn how to vape, they can compete in vaping competitions. Previously, people were concerned about the smell of tobacco. Well, now you can smell like cotton candy or sweet fruit or all sorts of different things. And you can see on the bottom left-hand side all of the different ways um, that different age groups are targeted. And you can see that there's tremendous exposure. In fact, one of the most frequent exposures is point of sale marketing, and it will actually double the likelihood that you will try either smoking or vaping. And we know that we've got to get these kids before they're 18. It makes a big difference in the addiction rates and the um, ability for people to get them to combat. So one third of the teenage experimentation with smoking can be directly attributed to tobacco marketing and retail. Um, you can see the places that it's there. Remember that over 375,000 retailers sell tobacco products, and that's 27 times more tobacco retailers than either McDonald's or Starbucks has. Now, in the past, you will have heard pediatricians, parents, and teachers say that these vape devices were easy to hide. And some teachers talked about these little ones in the center, these UBS drives, where sometimes teachers actually return them to students because they thought they were UBS drives. We can use some things that look like asthma inhalers um, as vape devices, and you can, you can see how they look here so that you can pick them out of a crowd. But now it's less likely that they feel they need to hide them. And you can now buy sweatshirts, t-shirts, backpacks, and they proudly display a vaping logo on them. Some of them will display um, marijuana leaves, but they're not so hard to pick out anymore. If you see a cloud of um, cotton candy smoke going by you, you can pretty much be sure, unless you're in a carnival, that you have someone who's vaping. Now, we became very concerned in 2018, which is where we started to see the tremendous spike in high school use. Cigarette use was going down, and you see the tremendous spike between 2018 and 2019 in the use of e-cigarettes. And when people asked kids what they were vaping, they said, oh, well, I'm not vaping tobacco. I'm not vaping, you know, there's no tobacco in here. Um, I'm just vaping flavors. But they were buying Juul. That had the largest market share in the country. And if you look at the Juul pod flavors, they're, they're called by fruit names. Mangoes and mints and cucumbers, and there are all sorts of sweet things, but all of the Juul pods have nicotine in them. And the overwhelming majority of the kids had no idea that they were vaping nicotine. And as pediatricians, we were very concerned that all the hard work that we did, all the hard work that the public health people did to decrease the use of tobacco products had been overturned by the tremendous uptick in the use of electronic cigarettes. Now, there are a couple of important things to look at when 
look at this infographic from the drugabuse.gov. Why are kids vaping? Well, previously we talked about the use of flavors and we'll talk about how they influence addiction. But in any case, depending on what they vape, they may do it to relieve tension. They may feel that they're gonna get high. But what's most important about this graph is that they also, a good percentage of them are saying, because I got hooked, because I need it, an addiction is a craving. So keep that in mind as you go. But the main reason that children start sm smoking um, electronic cigarettes is because of the flavors and because of the opportunity to mix and match your flavors, that's the major reason they go back to vaping. So let's look at Kentucky. And this is from Tobacco Free Kids. I compared Kentucky to the United States and you can see that uh, you have significantly more high school students who are smoking. Um, you have significantly more uh, kids that are vaping and we have about 2,000 kids in Kentucky each year who become new smokers. In the projections that come from your state, they say there are kids now who are under 18 who are alive, but will die prematurely from smoking. That's a pretty big number. And your annual health care costs are quite significant as well. So this is released today. Uh, it was in pre-publication a couple of days ago, but I had the opportunity to, to see it, but it's officially published in the MMWR today. And this was interesting because the National Youth Tobacco Survey does particular groups of months where they survey kids and they chose to survey uh, in 2020 between January 16th and March 16th. So this is directly before the, the height of our COVID pandemic. And it's interesting because the number of kids that were using e-cigarettes went down by about 1.8 million. I could have explained and made a beautiful story if I wanted to put this at COVID, but it didn't work out that way. I have made a beautiful story um, when I say there was a notable uptick in the use of disposable e-cigarettes by youth, but this wasn't COVID. So it's unclear yet why this happened, but yet during this time when they looked at the overall usage of e-cigarettes, it was still the flavored um, types in all of the devices. So we still have 3.6 million US youth still using e-cigarettes. And most of them are still going for the flavored e-cigarettes which is interesting because Juul took them, um, you know, had restricted the flavors, but there is still a lot of mix and match. And that's what I, I'm gonna caution you as we start to go through the pulmonary consequences. Be careful of the things that are made on the street. Now, just to remind everybody um, about the evolution of e-cigarettes, and this is probably more important now that we say uh, there's an uptick in the use of disposable cigarettes because these are first generation. Um, take a look at the four that we have. We have disposable cigarettes, which are the first generation. And then for two, three, and four, they're all refillable, which means that I can mix my own combinations. So the disposable cigarette, is uh, not rechargeable, not refillable, has to be discarded at the end and looks like a cigarette. So sometimes we call them cigalites. The sh second generation ones, you can put anything you please in it. You can put a little bit of nicotine, you can put some THC, you can put flavorings, um, and there's a battery and you heat it. But we're not burning tobacco leaves but we're heating a solution that contains nicotine and potentially other substances as well. The third generation is also rechargeable. You can use it multiple times. The problem with many of these multiple time uh, use devices is that people sh The third generation called the sub -um tank contains low resistance coils. And as you looked at some of the pictures before, and you'll see as we move forward, um, 
our teens have learned a little bit of chemistry. They know how to get a stronger hit of nicotine. Um, they've learned how to get higher doses. They've learned how to get um, the combinations to be delivered to a bigger plume. Um, so they've become quite sophisticated in the use of these drugs. And then the fourth generation, which is what you see most commonly now, uh, and you can see the, the difference between the free uh, base nicotine that you see in conventional tobacco to the nicotine salts, which are much more acidic in the vape devices. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about vaporizers. This is another way to um, deliver these medications or these um, substances. You can heat marijuana to a point where the active ingredient is in an aerosol as you breathe it. Um, you can add waxes and oils, and this has become a major problem, particularly as we move forward and talk about Ivali. Now let's look at Juul really as a standard because it has the biggest market share. One pack of cigarettes is approximately 20 milligrams of nicotine. And you can see that one pod has 41.3 milligrams of nicotine. Puff bars have 50 milligrams of nicotine. And then the Sawarin pod has 90. So look at the conversions. And you'll see that kids are taking tremendous amounts of nicotine. And yet when they think about it and they tell you about it, I'm only using one pod. This came from tobacco prevention. I wasn't sure it was going to go ahead and do this. OK, so all of them have high levels. You can also drip, gives you a larger plume, gives you a little more flavor, gives you a thicker cloud. Our kids are getting good at this, but they're also hurting themselves tremendously. Dripping is very dangerous because it exposes you to a higher level of the substance, whether it's nicotine or cannabis, and to the harmful toxins such as formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, uh, which are both known carcinogens. Okay, let's talk about nicotine. You all know that nicotine is a stimulant. It's highly addictive. And very interestingly, it causes changes in brain chemistry. The adolescent brain continues to develop until you're about 25, 26. And what nicotine does is it creates floods of dopamine. And for those of you that are involved in addiction, care. Um, the pleasure centers in the brain adapt to a drug by sensing the extra dopamine, and then it produces less. So now you have a hard time creating that natural feeling of pleasure without your nicotine. So they need more, and then they need more. And interestingly, a lot of this is also tied to memory and to focus and learning. And these are things that um, really are more conducive to addiction as well. They certainly are not helpful to you. So it's primarily these floods and changes in the dopamine levels. And you can see when we look about the jewel rush and you look at how long it takes with a conventional cigarette, either the free base cigarettes and they use palm oil as an example here, but look how quickly Nicotine enters the bloodstream with Juul. It's just about five minutes. And on the other side, if you look at the right side of this screen, you can see how quickly Juul developed market share. As of last year, it was about three quarters of the market, of the non-conventional um, tobacco market. Now, this is also from the uh, MMWR that's going to be published today. And it looks at how many kids are preferring uh, flavors in their e-cigarettes. And we look at it by device. And the fruit is the dark black one. And you can see the others as you go along here. But in every single category, the pre-filled pods, the disposable, the tanks, the mod surfaces, 
the fruit flavors are preferred. What else is in the vape uh, aerosol? What else is in the tobacco smoke? There are variable amounts of volatile organic compounds, nicotine, ultrafine particles, cancer-containing chemicals, heavy metals, and then your flavorings. But remember, when we talk about these flavorings, things like diacetyl, while they're used in food products without any harm, they were never meant to be smoked. Keep in mind here that as you look at um, many of the commercially available uh, e-liquids, that many of them that say they're nicotine free are not. Many of the amounts that are listed on the label have not proven to be true. Another concern that we need to have as pediatricians is to look at the marijuana use. Now here um, in Mish's study, which was again just published this year, look at the difference in the marijuana use in eighth graders, because those are our re really our future users. So from 2017 to 2019, it's almost doubled. It's gone from in the fours to the eights. Look at the 10th graders from the fours to the nines. Um, and the 12th graders, again, it's nearly doubled. So these are tremendous numbers. We need to start uh, educating our children, our students, now that we're back at school. Um, it's really a little school that we have to go after because by the time you're um, in high school, it may be more, much more difficult to talk about cessation techniques. In terms of behavior, once you've started smoking, it's much harder uh, to quit. If we look at prevention statistics in pediatrics versus cessation techniques, in the high schools, prevention is far more effective. We know that when we're talking about the pleasure sensors in the, the pleasure sensor centers in the brain, um, e-cigarette use is linked to use of other illicit substances, including marijuana, recreational marijuana, um, also cocaine, alcohol, and some of the other drugs as well. Okay, now we're gonna move on to some of the potential respiratory consequences of vaping. We all um, were interested in Navali and remember that we have over 2,500 hospitalized cases, 60 fatalities, um, and Kit would have documented use and diagnosed Navali down to age 13. Uh, we've had two pediatric deaths in the New York area, one in New York City and one in New Jersey. So it's something that we really have to pay attention to. Now, when we have acute exposure to vaping, there's damage to airway cells, macrophages, and there's a decrease in neutrophil antimicrobial function. So you have a problem with fighting infection, you have a problem with immunity, um, just like you may with tobacco smoke. You'll see increased mucus production at a mucociliary clearance, and that's a hallmark of airway inflammation. Doesn't tell you what the inflammation is caused by, but it's certainly there. And so it should not be a surprise to you that we're seeing new cases of asthma, and we're seeing asthma exacerbations in kids who vape. And there are a number of components within the vaping uh, aerosol that can put you at risk for exacerbations of your asthma and for newly diagnosed asthma. Uh, the exposure to reactive carbonyls, including formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and acrolein, um, have all been implicated. Now, I particularly like this um, study, and I would advise the students and the fellows in particular to take a look at it. It's got a lot of very nice um, diagrams and it's got some uh, very nice pathology and uh, imaging studies in here. So this has uh, recently come out as well and they look deliberately at some of the major components of e-cigarette 
vapors that we are particularly concerned about, the propylene glycol, which we talked about, THC, which is a major um, issue for us, some of the flavorants, vitamin D acetate, E acetate, and the heavy metals. It shows you what happens to the airways. There's inflammation, there's increased mucus production, there's impaired muco mucociliary clearance. It shouldn't surprise you the way they behave clinically. All of this inflammation damages the bronchial epithelium. You're gonna see increased cytokines, more oxidative stress, and you're gonna be at risk for more infections. Now, during a pandemic of SARS-CoV-2, it's an issue. It's a concern. We need to um, make sure that as our kids go back to school, that we've addressed a number of these issues and that every pediatrician um, is available as a resource for their schools. Now, based on this, we know that there are a number of different presentations, uh, lots of different kinds of acute parenchymal lung injury. And so in a systematic review by Jonas et al, published at the end of June of this year, we see there are four different types of imaging findings and pathology findings um, that have been reported with Ivali and lung-related injury. You can have the multifocal ground glass opacities, which you can see up in um, image A. You can see the nice organizing pneumonia. And I apologize that I don't have a pointer here, but um, I think if you look at these, Im these CT images, you'll see tremendous involvement, whether it's patchy, multifocal, or very diffuse and ground glass, it is not a surprise to you. These children should have significant difficulty breathing, that they should have very impaired oxygenation, and that they may require uh, ventilatory support. And in some cases, we know we've had kids that have been on ECMO, and we did have someone who, um, there was a report of someone who had a double lung transplant. Now let's move on a little bit to COVID-19. There was a recent paper um, by Pat Wardian from the UK, and she was looking at the risk of smoking rates and by extension to vaping rates um, in people who were quarantined during the COVID pandemic. We know that during social isolation and things that when you're in an anxious situation, um, smoking and vaping can be relaxing. We had the perfect storm. People were quarantined, they couldn't go out. It's very easy to get vaping supplies. They come right to your house, Amazon drops them off at your door. Um, be careful. This was something that we were very worried about um, for smokers and vapors. And we know that these things have a tremendous effect on your vulnerability. So let's look at it in summary. Some of the patients may already have existing lung disease. You know that your FEV1 goes down not only as you get older, but you have reduced lung capacity if you're a smoker. And we have a number of kids that have been smoking since they were in grade school. Technically, we only are asking the question for 12 and up on our EMRs, you know, or are required to ask on our EMRs from 12 and up. But if you ask, particularly in families where there are smokers at home, you will find that the exposures are higher. Also, when we quarantined adult smokers with their families, we are increasing the exposure to secondhand smoke for the children. Patients are also at increased risk because behaviors that facilitate transmission, particularly as we showed you with the vaporizer devices, uh, some of the refillable devices, uh, we have the ability to share infections, be they COVID or any other. Some of the pathophysiology that we talked about with vaping and smoking, the reduced cough sensitivity, impaired mucociliary clearance, 
and the immune suppression can increase your risk of pneumonia. And so this paper here, again, which came out this year, um, should not be a surprise to you. This was by uh, Martha Cather, uh, the association between youth smoke with electronic cigarettes and coronavirus. The study showed that teen vapors had up to seven times more likelihood to get COVID-19 as opposed to non-users. I put these two images here because I've seen them more than I care to. Uh, we've talked that kids shouldn't be using their masks as a chin strap. And here you can see they just smoke right over it. And then there are vape parties where people are exercising their right to do as they please. So when we're at a time when we're trying to social distance and prevent exposing other people to potentially asymptomatic COVID patients, these types of behavior are counterproductive. Okay, so let's talk about EVALI. EVALI stands for e-cigarette vaping associated lung injury. We don't know how it starts. We know it when we have it, and it appears to be a form of lung injury that has pathologic findings that include uh, fibrinous pneumonitis. It's an acute fibrinous pneumonitis, diffuse alveolar damage, um, usually bronchocentric with an organizing pneumonia, sometimes with an accompanied bronchiolitis. So it may be more than one thing, um, or it may be a spectrum because the mechanisms appear to be a little bit different. Now remember that Ivali was initially described in August of 2019 with a cluster of patients presenting to hospitals with a recent history of vaping and then subsequent pulmonary and constitutional symptoms. So as of February this year, which is really a, a relatively short time since it was initially described, there were 2,800 hospitalized cases and 66 deaths. So we are just now starting to get information. And um, within the last week or so, there was a new work group that came and I'll finish my talk with that, um, but we still have a lot to learn. So the potential candidates have to do with THC, vitamin E, acetate, and nicotine. When we talk about the other oils, there's a lot we don't know in here. And it's very important when you talk to patients where you may suspect the diagnosis to get your hands on, if you can, a sample of what they use to smoke. Many times when I've had that experience and I've tried to do it, they're not willing to give up a dealer. Um, but nonetheless, if you can get it, it's usually um, not the commercial ones that are giving people trouble. So the clinical features are fairly well um, put together at this point in time. The mean duration of symptoms prior to presentation is generally around six days, but it can range from zero to two months. And approximately one third of the patients will progress to acute respiratory failure. Some will require uh, support. Um, and as we said before, I do know of one patient who had a double lung transplant. I do know of a 17 year old that died. Um, there are these reports are on the CDC website, but you're going to read about, I'm sure you're going to have a chance to read more about them as time goes on. But when you looked at those CT scans, it should be no surprise to you that um, the respiratory symptoms are exactly what they are because they can have acute pulmonary hemorrhages. You may see some hemoptysis. They can be short of breath, have a cough, chest pain but gastrointestinal symptoms can occur as well, and they're here. So we suspect a valley in patients who vape or use other e-cigarette related products, who develop pneumonia-like symptoms with progressive dyspnea or worsening hypoxemia. 
Now in the workups, we're going to be concerned about all the other things that can do this besides vaping. And so you'll see when we start to take our history that we're looking for other exposures, that we're looking at um, pulmonary toxic medications, activities that can give you hypersensitivity, pneumonitis. We're looking for other things. But if we see the opacities on imaging, we're going to think a little harder on it. So some of the labs that are done, and this is from the interim guidance uh, from the uh, MMWR in October of 19. And you'll see we are again looking for evidence of inflammatory markers. We're considering all the viral pathologies. We talked about um, gastrointestinal issues on the slide before, although I'm not going to focus on the um, GI components of this. Um, and certainly your, your blood counts. Now, if you have a patient who behaves atypically or who is hypoxic, you have no questions that you're going to go ahead and do the chest X-ray. And you're going to consider a number of various patterns, and we showed you some of them, the diffuse alveolar damage, the eosinophilic uh, pneumonia, the hypersensitivity pneumonitis, organizing or lipoid pneumonia. But bilateral opacities are common right across the board. So you may um, have great help um, and you will do it appropriately if you have uh, need to do a high resolution CT. Now in August of this year, there was a paper that was presented looking at pathologic specimens there were 10 which were biopsy specimens and 11 autopsies. The biopsy cases most frequently showed diffuse alveolar damage with a small amount having an organizing pneumonia. And the autopsies overwhelmingly showed diffuse alveolar damage. And there were a few other uh, cases in here. I have, have them listed for you, um, but overwhelmingly, the answer was diffuse alveolar damage, and this was just uh, published. Now, what about bronchoalveolar lavage? We decide on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no strict rule about um, a particular algorithm to follow, but you know that um, infections such as influenza, mycoplasma, fungal and viral pathogens can uh, certainly give you pictures that look like this. The cell counts from your BAL, the cytopathology, and all of your infectious studies can help point you in that direction. You can't sell your soul on your cell counts because they can be variable, but neutrophils have been shown to be increased in about 91%. Lipid-laden macrophages, which are frequently seen with aspiration, are common, but not specific to this population. So the CDC diagnostic criteria are fourfold. Uh, the use of an e-cigarette or a related product in the past 90 days. Lung opacities on the chest X-ray or CT. The exclusion of lung infection, which is extremely important, and you have to test for this before you can give Ivali as a diagnosis. And the same thing with the absence of a likely alternative diagnosis. So where are we? This is the state of Ivali in 2020. The emergency room visits related to e-cigarettes or vaping continue to decline since September of 2019. Now remember that as of March, our kids have been out of school and they may have had more limited access than they have now. As of November 26th, the states are asked only to report cases of hospitalized cases of Valley to CDC. And as of February of this year, they are no longer accepting clinical or product samples related to Ivali. So I'm hoping, um, as I'm sure all of you are, that the cases will continue to go down until we don't see them anymore. 
So where are we now? We don't know if it's over and we don't know as school starts whether the numbers are going to increase. So the NIH released a workshop report and they are asking for more biospecimens from Ivali patients. They're trying to define the, the pathogenesis of Ivali and to define the risks of vaping as they differ from the risks of smoking. And then to broaden e-cigarette research beyond the comparators to tobacco smoke and tobacco smoke related diseases. So we still have a long way to go. Um, any of the pediatricians who are in the group may be asked by their school districts to come and speak about it because there still is a good amount of concern. Um, we have concerns not only about influenza and COVID as the fall progresses, but also about some of the behaviors and some of the um, opportunities that students will have as they go back to school. So I will make that my last slide and see if anyone has any questions. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cataletto. There are no questions in the chat, so if anyone has any questions, you may go ahead and unmute your microphones at this time. I have a question. Um, so while we can all agree that we should be advising patients to not vape and to stop using vaping products. Is there any, are there any like harm reduction techniques um, you would advise in patients that are just like really um, dedicated to sticking with it? I think Dr. Cataletto accidentally left the session, um, so I will go ahead and post her email address in the chat one more time, so um, any questions you can connect with her offline. Thanks everyone for joining.